Hello and welcome to this video about the chi-squared test of independence. We're going to explore what it means, what it's for, and this notion of expected frequencies, which is really at the heart of understanding uh, how we put a chi-squared test into action. So here it is, the chi-squared independence test. This is the Greek letter chi. It's often written like this. So let's just explore the, the notion for a moment, uh, if, if we may, about a traditional scatter graph with which we may be familiar. Say we measure a person's height and their arm span. We can do that for a number of people and look to see if there's a relationship between the two. We can plot that data on a numerical axis. We can put arm span along here with the smaller values there and the higher values there. And we can put height here with the smaller values there and the higher values there. And in that sense, each cross on this scatter graph becomes a person. It's a person. So this is a person with a small arm span and a small height. And this is a person with a large arm span and a large height. So if the results came out like this, which they probably would, we could definitely conclude that there's a strong relationship between height and arm span. The bigger the arm span, the bigger the height. And that's a positive correlation. And that works lovely with a scatter graph. Um, and that's because that data is numerical. We can put it in order. We can put it on an axis. But not all the data we want to work with is like that. Often we find that we need to, uh, to, to look for relationships between categorical bits of data. Take this example. What if we were to ask the question about whether or not a person's political persuasion might be dependent on their gender? We're asking if we think that maybe females would be more likely to be left-wing or males more likely to be right-wing, for example. Neither of these bits of data are numerical. They can't be put on an axis. They can't be put in an order. And so we need a way of testing for a relationship between these two bits of data that's different from a scatter graph because we can't use the numerical axis. And that is where the chi-squared independence test comes in. So if we're going to do this chi-squared independence test to see if there's a relationship between gender and political persuasion, we're going to need some data. Uh, there are lots of ways to get data, but one good way is to knock up a quick Google form, pass it around your friends and acquaintances on social media, and get some real life data to work with about people's political persuasion and their gender. And once you've got that data, you're going to need to put it into uh, a contingency table. Okay, keep it organized so that we can use it, uh, we can analyze it. And this is an example of the table that we would have, and this is called a two by three contingency table. And that's because for one of my questions, there are only two possible answers, male and female. And for my other question, there are three possible answers. I've decided to split political persuasion into three categories, left wing politics, central politics, and right-wing politics. And so what we can see quickly here in this two by three table is that there are in fact one, two, three, four, five, six possible answers to the questions of our survey. At this point, I need to make a formal apology for what's about to happen. So here it comes. Please accept my apologies for some terrible gender stereotyping. I could be a man with left-wing politics. I could be female and have left-wing politics. I could be a man with central politics. Well, I could be female with central politics. And I could be a man with right-wing politics. And I could be female but with right-wing politics. So, now that we have rather embarrassingly established that quite clearly that there are six categories of answer, six categories of people that we have, in this particular question, uh, we can get on to the nitty gritty of what this independence test is all about. Um, and that the whole crux of an independence test is that it starts with a very clear assumption that there is no relationship. In this case, that there is no relationship between gender and political persuasion. That a person's gender has no bearing whatsoever on their politics. And that is the point at which we must start this test. 
And associated with that point is that we have to come up with some answers about what we would expect to happen assuming that there is no relationship. And then we can compare that to what did actually happen and the difference there, the measure of that difference is how we make a conclusion about whether or not there is a relationship. So we have to focus now on this very important idea of expected frequencies. What we would expect to happen. And so what I've got here is my contingency table, only I haven't got the actual data, the actual responses of people. What I have are the totals of a, some possible responses here. And so in this particular survey, what I can see is that I asked 200 men and that I also asked 200 women. I can also see that of the people that I asked, the 400 people that I asked, 250 of them were right wingers. 50 of them had central politics and then 100 had left. OK, and so what I've got is these totals here, but I don't have the actual figures of what happened. All right. Now I can get busy with the notion of what I would expect to happen, what, how I would expect these to be distributed, given that there's no relationship. OK, key point here. So if I had 200 of each, I could say that one half of my population, the population of my survey, one half of them were male. And so if there's no relationship, I expect to learn that one half of the left wingers were male and that well, one half were female. OK, that that same distribution, a half of my whole population was male, is true amongst the left wingers as well. So in this case, another survey where I asked a total of 400 people, there were 100 males and 300 females. And of those 400 people, 80 of them said they were left wing, 200 said they were centre, and 120 said they had right wing politics. And so, again, if we take this clear assumption that there is no relationship, then given that I could say that one quarter of my population, 100 out of 400, were male, well, then I would expect one quarter of these 80 people to be male as well. So that would be 20 with the other 60, the three quarters being female of these 200 people. I would expect one quarter of them to be male as well. And I would expect the other 150, the three quarters who are female to be there. And then lastly, this group of 120 right wingers, I would expect one quarter of them, 30 to be male and the other three quarters to be female. So clearly we could go on with lots of similar examples. So we'll just do one more. The first one was a familiar fraction, a half and a half. The second one was also familiar, a quarter and three quarters. Clearly those fractions could become less familiar, but the principle doesn't change. So let's just take this last example here. Imagine a case where I asked 400 people of whom 80 were males and 320 were females. 140 said they were left wing, 65 centre and 195 right. What we've got here then is uh, some slightly less familiar fractions, but the same thing stands. I, if I know that 80 four hundredths of my population were male, then what I'm saying is that 80 four hundredths of this 140 people need to be male. OK, so 80 four hundredths times 140 is 28 so I know I've got 28 males and then equally this group here if I know that 320 four hundredths of my population are female then I would expect that fraction of these 65 people to be female so I've got 320 four hundredths times 65 which gives me that's 52 and that is how we deal with this notion of an expected frequency this assumption that there is no relationship. We calculate the expected frequencies and the next step is all about how we compare that with what actually did happen to see if we can conclude about whether or not there's a relationship between gender and political persuasion. And that 
is the essence of a chi-squared test of independence.